All right, good, uh, what is it? Good afternoon, everyone. How are you feeling? <laughs> Long day, did you have your coffee? <laughs> I hope you did. Um, so we're gonna kick off a, our panel discussion this afternoon. Um, I apologize in advance. It is the first time I do this. I feel very nervous, especially because there are like very famous people here in the panel. Uh, so please be gentle. Uh, first of all, I would like to go ahead and thank all the panelists for being here. I will introduce them quickly. Uh, going from your uh, right to left, we have Dr. Julian Yordachita from Johns Hopkins, uh, Emmanuel van der Porten, KU Leuven, uh, Paolo Fiorini from the University of Verona in Italy, uh, Farok Atazar, I hope I said it correctly, Farok, uh, New York University, Jie Ying Wu from Vanderbilt, and we have a new guest uh, that was not announced on the program, uh, Dr. Ken Goldberg the from surprise part, actually. Yeah, from UC Berkeley, or should I say Cal? Seems to be like the hot topic these days. Uh, thank you for joining us on such a, sh such a short notice. Um, so we have heard from many of you this morning, but we didn't get a chance to hear from Farok and can yet. So why don't we kick this off by asking Farok and Ken to briefly describe for our audience what your uh, general research interests are and then how you are interested in machine learning and medical applications specifically. Okay. Hello, everybody. This is Farok uh, from New York University. So I'm going to see my talk in a little bit. And so my main focus is basically human, human machine interaction, human robot interaction. Uh, both physical and cognitive. So physical is like haptic cellular robotics and cognitive. It goes from like connecting the brain and muscles of the of human to the control of robots. Application is medical, uh, going from rehabilitation to uh, surgical robotics. It's a pleasure to be here with amazing panel. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. And I apologize for we were in another session and I actually have another session to go to. And it's it's just a, a what should we say, a, a, a blessing and a curse to have so many workshops going on in one day. But I, I, I think we have been using machine learning to solve, to address some of the perception problems for manipulation. And it's, and I would say that I feel like those are gonna be continuing to be important for perception of, of deformable materials, the perception of when there's um, viscous materials, because that tends to create um, a lot of distortion for any kind of light um, monitoring. I do share the concerns that I believe you're all thinking about, which is that, you know, there's an unpredictability and lack of guarantees with, um, with a soft, with, with deep learning in particular. So I think those are the, the, the but I, in some sense, I don't think we can avoid using deep learning. It's going to, it is, it is opening up a lot of interesting new doors. The trick is, I think, how do we create confidence measures for the robot system so that it knows when it's, it's, it's not as confident. Um, and then it can, uh, for example, call the human in because the, the idea is that we have, we always will have humans standing by, right? So we want to be able to, to relieve the, the burden on the human surgeon but um, but but obviously we always have the surgeon is is going to have the the a finger hopefully on the stop button. Cool. About the machine learning question that you asked, I can quickly. Yes. yes, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, sorry, I forgot this question to answer. Uh, 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 so what we do uh, in terms of machine learning, we focus on using uh, deep learning machine learning to decode human neurophysiology and considering human as part of a closed loop and to understand this code of uh, motor intention uh, by going deep into the signals uh, using either shallow or deep learning. But uh, as Ken mentioned, there's a lot of concerns and challenges uh, in terms of the like robustness, reliability, and the amount of data, especially when it comes to the medical aspects. Great, thank you. So um, to kick the conversation off, I'm gonna just tell you a very brief story and then I'm gonna ask a provocative question. Uh, 10 years ago, I was a first year PhD student. And I remember I went to my first conference, I had an encounter with uh, Brian Davis, some of you may know, um, he's regarded as one of the fathers of surgical robotics. S certainly in Europe, he was the first to 
build surgical robots. And so, you know, first year PhD student, I meet this, you know, celebrity in the field, I go talk to him naturally. And he asks me the question that every, you know, researcher would ask to a first year PhD student, what do you do? Or what would you want to do in your PhD? And I said, oh, you know, my dream is I would like to use AI and machine learning to make surgical robots more intelligent and make them able to perform surgical procedures autonomously. And Brian Davis looked back at me and he was like, okay, you don't know what you're doing. He didn't say exactly, you don't know what you're doing, but very <laughs> graciously, but firmly made me understand that, you know, I had to do some extra reading. And then I found these papers where essentially he was saying uh, about his early experiences in the nineties about building these robots that were doing parts of a procedure autonomously and how he got a lot of pushback from physicians. Fast forward 10 years, we are talking a lot about autonomy in surgical robots. What do you think has changed in this 10 years? Has it just been advances in AI or has there been, have you also observed the change in acceptance uh, towards these technologies? Does anybody want to take it first? Well, I love that story. And I think um, the one thing that is clearly changed is the <clears throat> patent protection on intuitive. And I think that, I, I mean, I think it was around 2016 that those patents started running out. So then I think that's changed because they had a very firm position um, against, you know, for a variety of good reasons, which was liability and, and um, <clears throat> doctor acceptance, as you're saying. But now that there's more competitors, I think it's changed the landscape. Uh, I think I'm ill-positioned to answer what happened 10 years ago. I was starting undergrad, but um, I think uh, as a DVRK person, I also have to add that I think DVRK has had a really big impact that how can we even imagine what surgery and AI will look like together without a platform to do it on and a platform that is shared so that a group can reproduce another one's results. Yeah, so... From my opinion, one of the, so I remember when I was a PhD student actually, so there was this heat of like parallel processing. So if you do parallel processing, you, you're going to like change the field, which changes later to like deep learning. And uh, I think that one of the things that changed was the computational power. And then a lot of people got interested in like, let's see what we can get out of it. And as roboticists, we always, we are experimentalists, right? So we want to experiment this deep learning and see if it can help us in one way or another. And then uh, again, from a very junior perspective, I'm, I'm saying that. And uh, that's how I actually I started doing deep learning for robotics. I just wanted to experiment. And, and I think we find a lot of potential, which we got us excited. And then when we get to the implementation, we got a lot of troubles, which got us a bit disappointed. So I, I am personally in somewhere between the excitement and disappointment at this point. So I'm trying to find my path through. Yeah, that's my story. Well. <clears throat> 10 years ago uh, for the short time actually uh, let's go back a few years later well a few years earlier 30 years ago there was uh, the neural network were invented and there was a, another surge like uh, these days basically uh, those of us who are doing a research in robotics and probably can remember something all our funds disappeared because of, uh, all the funds were diverted to AI. And, and at that time, they were the conferable uh, neural network. Uh, which, well, they were all, all shallow at that time. And uh, that, that was a, a long strike of uh, sort of promises and then failures. Uh, there were expert systems and, and, and so forth. So then eventually, this first wave of AI disappeared. And then we returned back to sort of modeling and, and things like that. Uh, so now we are in, in a sense, in a sec in the second wave, and uh, so that's why some of the perplexity of, of us were being around for a few years. Uh, but now we have, as Farouk mentioned, new hardware, which at that time wasn't available, so we couldn't do uh, fast computation. New algorithms, uh, deep learning wasn't uh, well. There was learning; there were uh, sort of the, 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 the classical learning algorithm, but not optimization. Uh, they were not running fast. So the combination of hardware and the new algorithm is 
providing new things and there are more people willing to test and, and to to explore this field so uh, again we are in this new wave but it seems a little bit more solid than it was on the in the ground seems to be a little bit solid about 30 years ago um yeah <clears throat> I have not much more to add on this, but uh, um, so I'm a mechanic, so my AI knowledge is uh, limited. So, but what I see is, at least overall in the news, AI is in the uh, is being uh, talked about. There is more funding for AI. If you're uh, going to a conference with clinicians, they are very uh, eager to use the term AI, and that they are using that, even that they have no clue of what is going on uh, behind. So. I think that's um, uh, there are some uh, remarkable uh, success stories. In the field of surgical robotics, there is definitely a, a huge growth in uh, research. And there are some small, I think, at this stage, um, implementations where AI is actually used. But I don't, I'm, I'm not, um, um, I think that the level is, we're getting somewhere now, but it's still, uh, far from doing anything autonomous or uh, in the real clinic. So that still remains much uh, being uh, research uh, in the lab so far. Maybe it takes place in uh, companies as, as well to some extent, but um, I think we will still have probably 10 years ahead before there is some real autonomy in uh, surgical robotics, I think. Okay, so uh, I am an old uh, school mechanical engineer. So for me, uh, AI, it's still not uh, my field. Uh, I remember when I visited WPI and I present some of my work in the robot assisted retinal surgery, Louis asked me, I, I was talking about a lot of data force information and Louis told me that this could be for, uh, you know, deep learning. And after that, I went back to my lab and talking with my students, I asked them, look, if we could use this for, uh, uh, you know, providing safety, I think that would be great. So, and you saw this morning, we try to solve that in, in a way is possible to be done. And now, because my students, they would like to have uh, AI in their CV, we are looking to, uh, you know, how to use it for autonomy. Yeah. So I guess there are definitely a change um, uh, in how we percept uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning, and how to use it. So if I want to summarize, basically, that's the thing that I really like with like discussions like this. We started from industry driven, basically thoughts coming to the university and that brings in money to the universities as well. Right. So basically industry changes the minds of these government agencies that we need to work on AI and ML and all these techniques. And then luckily, hopefully we can get some money to do this type of research. And then the platforms, hardware, right? If you don't have the hardware, let's say for surgery or like rehab research, if you don't have it, we can't do anything. Thanks to the Intuitive and then DVRK, all the universities that contributed. Now we have a platform, similar platform that we can share the data. Hopefully we are going to talk about data soon. And then Farrokh said computational power, right? I do remember I was undergrad by the time, more than 10 years ago, I'm bald, right? So that was that excitement of uh, what actually Paulo mentioned. So I was an undergrad. Okay, I want to publish a paper, what Julian mentioned. It's very easy. There is a, like a black box if you collect some data. Of course, I didn't use it for surgical robotics, but that was exciting. There is something you throw it in and then it throws out something that I didn't know what is in, but it was working. I could publish, right? So I was undergrad. I was very excited. And then as Julian mentioned, again, coming back to the industry, so you want to find a job. They are looking for people knowing how to work with these basically toolboxes, right? You need to know how to use Python and C++ and somehow change your direction that I don't like as much, my opinion, sorry. That for students, we are learning basically, our background is mechanical engineering, like fluid dynamics, thermodynamics, robotics. Suddenly they switch to data scientists which I don't like as much that you forget all these learnings for 10 more years and then suddenly switch because the job is over there, right? It has its own panacea and alchemy as well to me, but it's good if you wanna look at it from the positive perspective, right? So I wanna say you somehow mentioned in your talks actually, 
how and uh, in your research, let's say surgical robotics, rehab robotics, you're using it in different application, right? Can you tell us again, so how much you trust and in what type of application you would like to use it as of now and 10 years from now? Let's say everything goes good and then we have reliable techniques and then money comes in and then the students are also interested. Can you please tell me what type of research now and then maybe in 10 years, you would see yourself doing it. Go ahead, you know, please. Like, uh, yeah, I, I will start here. Um, I would like to add another uh, perspective uh, here. So um, I have been uh, some NIH review panels uh, talking about the grants that they are proposing to use artificial intelligence. It's a difficult product to sell to NIH. And basically what, what we are doing, we show, look, I would like to do this type of research and I could do, you know, classically, but also I like to try artificial intelligence. Now, if, if you ask me, I, because the, the student who like, you know, to, to work in artificial intelligence, I'm pretty sure we'll try to solve the problems, uh, you know, using modern ways. But once we go back and we like to uh, show results to uh, NIH or clinicians, we still need to be very consistent and show, yes, it's working. Um, yeah, for the type of research we're doing now on AI is, um, so there is a lot of uh, work on image processing and so on. That's covered by others. We don't need to do that. They are much better than that, but we are mechanical engineers. So our uh, interest is to see how can, can we use this AI to improve models of mechanic systems that are relatively complex. So with uh, friction, uh, hysteresis, Nonlinear behavior, um, and then uh, kind of combining that with model-based approaches. Uh, let's say that would be uh, what, where we are interested in looking at. There is not that many groups looking at that yet, so that's why we um, we we see how far we can get there. How do you see it in the future? If you want to answer that question, let's say everything works well. So, what is your dream application in your research? You want to do it with machine yeah. learning. Yeah, my dream application is not actually linked to AI. My dream application would be to develop a surgical robotic system that can uh, improve uh, interventions that do treatments that are not possible uh, otherwise. So if that can be done with AI, fine. Otherwise, um, without is, is even better, probably. Do you want to add something? Yeah, you did. Uh, sorry, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, we, we are dreaming to do uh, autonomous uh, retinal uh, surgery. I don't think uh, they will allow us, but at least to try to scratch the eyes and to see what, what could be done. I think the technology is there, but uh, it's, it's more to work and to show, prove, uh, you know, uh, good results. But you think it's doable, right? Okay, good. Okay, let me continue this perspective because I think that uh, one uh, important step would be to get products out, get system, get get real devices used by people. And here we had a problem on certification, regulation. So again, I'm, I'm more interested in getting a product, getting a surgical robot, uh, uh, something that is, uh, you know, I, I feel now that there is this sort of robotic divide that, that people can afford uh, uh, can afford to have a, a robot and even in, in rich countries uh, not all the hospitals are, are, are allowed or able to have robots i think we need to move in that direction and probably autonomy can help because we can use uh, or autonomy or, or learning because we can use cheaper materials cheaper sensor plastics and compensating with proper the properties with some specific uh, algorithm learning or or but the problem is how do we certify these machines and, and so one thing that would be very interesting very challenging is to again use ai to certify ai be on the other side of the fence how can somehow uh, get the, the reliability the, 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 the trustworthy that the system like this can must have to be able to be certified so yeah. I think this will be the real challenge for the future. Very good point. Basically, you're saying regulation and then trustworthiness of the data, two new things that moving forward. But I want to add that luckily with like GI Genius, like J&J &J in the US, they are moving toward that. That's a very first step in diagnosis, right? We got FDA approval, but there are a lot of works I know they are working on with the regulation. Farouk. Yeah, I actually love the question like that. 
if we can trust AI. So for me, the question is a bit like deeper, like wh what is AI, right? So uh, like if I give you a Fourier series and I be solved it in real time using recursive Lisa square, is it like a AI or learning? It is basically, it's an iterative algorithm that you can try. So AI existed like for many years and we trusted AI for, for a long time. What we are seeing now is a, is a is this huge box that's like we call it deep learning and we put the data in we get something out so can i try to trust ai i think if i can trust the data and i can trust who i mean the person expertise that trained that model and then if i can see somehow what is the attention of that ai like explainable ai that we're talking about like using these algorithms like gradcam and other algorithms that can tell us what this AI is looking at. I think we can trust AI because we have been trusting AI, but but if it's just a data that we're really not sure how the data was collected. And if we basically don't know how the data was being trained, how the model is being trained. So I, th I don't think it can be trustable. So the question I think has other aspects. So basically you're adding two other things. So you're saying how we can trust, how we can, how that data been collected and what's happening inside that box, right? So Cenk. So I think there's a lot more work to be done in integrating our different algorithms. So right now we have an algorithm to do autonomous suturing, do autonomous um, debridement, but that's not combined with the algorithm that estimates the surgeon is currently doing suturing or the surgeon is currently doing debridement. It should recognize that. And those two are not combined with the system that um, estimates how is the soft tissue deforming, how is the um, blood flowing, where should I suture? Where should I um, do the bridemen? And so I think the immediate next question is how can we combine these so that the uh, robot can reason more holistically? And in 10 years, I hope we'll have solved that and we'll be answering questions like, okay, that's what the surgeon is doing. How can we integrate the rest of the operating room? What should the nurses have prepped? Should the nurse know that we need to have the suture in preparation for the surgeon needing it? And what about the stocking and inventory? How can we make sure that those sutures are there when the surgeon needs it? So I think just growing what we consider part of our system is necessary. So integration and standardizing, that's another keyboards I'm hearing. Um, no, I appreciate the question also. And I think, you know, coming back to the, what can we do with our autonomy right now? And, and you raised the question about friction and, and um, cabling, hand handling cables. So that was one area that we actually were able to um, address to some degree, what, which was the imprecision of the, of the DBRK. So for years, it was always in the range of about five centimeters. And it was just not, you couldn't do anything with that. So what, what, um, um, uh, Minyo Hong, who, who was a PhD, uh, a postdoc in my lab, had a very clever idea. We, we basically put um, fiducials and we trained a deep network by sampling the commanded motions and then measuring the actual motions. Then we, um, we could invert that. What it turned out to be very important was um, we also, we took long, a sequence of, of motions and then it turned out that the, it was the sign of the velocity that played a crucial role. What was that? Well, the cable, you depended which direction you were approaching that point from, because that was the cable windup, was critical. It was just a, a variable that we hadn't considered before. But as soon as we saw that, and we, see, we could see it by looking at the, at the model of the, the network, then we could compensate for it very nicely. And it brought the, um, the, the precision down to under a centimeter, under a millimeter. So this is an example. And then we, we were able to show uh, peg, peg transfer, you know, the, the FLS um at at at, at precision it, um, on par with the trained surgeon and at speed that was on par with the trained surgeon and so this was surprising to me that we could actually do this now it's all a rigid environment so you're not dealing with all the complexities we're talking about about in body um manipulation but i think it's a sign that we could actually make progress i will also say though that a huge part of this what minho did was um develop a new inverse kinematics model and that's old school you know, analytics uh, for the for the for the DVRK. So we should we should keep our eyes open. I think you're right. There's a danger. Paolo's, you know, I think it was people saying getting intoxicated by deep learning and thinking you could just do everything with deep learning end to end. And that is, I think, a mistake because there's all of this great theory that we've developed and the field has developed over the past centuries that we should bring to bear because that's provable and you can get performance guarantees. 
So I think that, but you're right to be careful about that. My, my answer to that is that the surgeon will always be right there. And so to, to have a guarantee, you, you probably, it's going to be very hard to get guarantees, but if the surgeon, if it's relieving the tedium of doing a suturing or debridement steps with under careful observation of the surgeon who can stop it at any point, I think that we could get there because you don't guarantee perfection, but the surgeon is essentially your, your rail, your guardrail. So basically what I'm hearing is some sort of physics aware machine learning and use whatever is out there, like Paolo mentioned, right? He was saying, okay, we know some information beforehand, right? From the biomechanics, from the knowledge of the surgeon, let's not just throw it out. We already know that knowledge, right? So let's not trash it. Let's use it together with this AI to make a complementary AI, whatever you want to call it. But we shouldn't just pass it over and then leverage on that and augment the surgeon with machine learning and other knowledges that we already have, right? Exactly. Thank you. And I'm going to have to leave in a few minutes, but don't take it as I'm getting up and leaving in a huff or anything like that. So, <laughs> okay, Thanks for joining us. So before you leave, I actually have a question for everybody, including you. Uh, so I've, I've, we've been hitting lots of uh, interesting items and we're hoping to, and there, there are at least a couple of them, including funding, I would love to follow up. But before we do that, there is one um, major item that I haven't heard mentioned until now in the discussion. Uh, because every time we talk about machine learning, of course, the two items everybody thinks about are algorithms, and we've been mentioning them. And the other one is looking at the audience, hoping they, they can data, exactly. Thank you, Manu. I haven't heard anyone talk about data until now. And that's, you know, like the, one of the two foundations, really. We, we need data. And I was hoping you could talk about, you know, like your, the, you know, the, the, how important data is for your specific application, how easy it is to get data. Because in some cases, you may just go online and download, let's say, like the Jigsaw data set. Yeah. In some other cases, you don't have data. You have to collect it, and it's expensive. So if I can answer real quickly, Jigsaw is a beautiful example of this. And I think that that was a, a, we should all look to the Johns Hopkins and their interactions with Intuitive. It was very carefully um, uh, collected, approved, anonymized, and then labeled. And so that's been enormously helpful. Many of us have used it. And so I would love to see more data sets like that. And I would also say to all junior researchers, you know, you can make a name for yourself building up a data set. And if you look at, you know, an ex so you, you've done that? There you go. I'm okay. attempting to get everyone to contribute to a central REPL oh. and everyone to collect the same data set oh, on perfect. Da Vinci. So I agree. So I, th thank you. That's perfect. I'm, I'll wait for that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, so I don't have a good um, solution. I think like it's not enough for it to be on one um, institution that like Hopkins has provided the jigsaws, but then the rest of us need to step up and each group needs to contribute. So one of the things I spent a whole lot of effort on my um, PhD was to talk to people for what frequency do you need the data at? What sort of uh, ROS topics do we need to collect? And we're hoping to then create tools where every single person, whenever you start a data collection, you just collect all these topics with the standardized tools we provide. And then we centralize it in one website where it points to everyone's individual websites, individual data sets, but it'll be described by what is the platform, who are the users, and what was the task. And so um, hopefully we'll have more groups creating things like Jigsaw. So let, let me intrude, what are the hurdles here? Some money or something? So what are the issues that the community can help? Because you are working on, <laughs> right? Go ahead. You have key opinion leaders here. Hopefully they can affect NIH and NSF, maybe grants just for this. Help people to collect data because it's valuable. Everyone working on techniques, but we don't have the food for those techniques, right? You can... Maybe go ahead. Yeah. Well, so I think one thing is, is it science to collect data? Is it science to build these tools? How to get them funded? So that's the issue that I have even for the papers we were discussing with Mano. Like they reject the papers, the contribution to the community is just the techniques, which is, I don't believe in it, right? Integration and preparation of the data has more value in long term rather than working on like fusing the data techniques. We have a lot of techniques without having preparation of the data, who is going to use that, right? So key opinion leaders, please talk to them. Yeah, we need to have 
money for just this type of integration work, even papers. Don't reject the papers, please. If there is like system <laughs> integration, right? You see system integration, the first thing they see, oh, there is no contribution. And unfortunately, it's just like 10 lines in one paragraph, the whole work that the PhD does in two years to just make that like one millimeter error or two millimeter error, right? That's a bad mindset we have in the community. That's, that should, we should give value more than just developing theoretical nonsense approaches that no one uses, right? So TRO papers, no one understands. Sorry, I'm very opinionated, but I had to say this. We got a lot of rejections recently. Go ahead now. <laughs> no, that's good. And I think like the other thing is how do we disseminate this idea? I feel like I'm chasing after researchers be like, share your data with me. But also we need a place to uh, host it, right? How, where do we put it? And how do we get funding to continuously fund this um, posting site or whatever? So these are solutions that need to come from the community. And I feel like how do we build that as part of the DVRK effort is this next step to consider. I talked a lot. That's amazing. So, yeah, I mean, that's a great, great topic to talk about. I mean, in terms of TRO, I, as a, <laughs> as I'm contributing to the, to the editorial board at the social editor of TRO, I, 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 I don't agree with that. <laughs> you have but, to, I know in deep but, down you love uh, this conversation. But, but I think there are, there are journals that actually, um, uh, that that can allow you to host the data, like uh, scientific data uh, in, under nature. They do that. I've seen a lot in the uh, rehab area these days, accelerated like exponentially. In surgical, I haven't seen much. So I think that's one of the aspects that, as Prashid mentioned perfectly, uh, with the support of a community and uh, funding agencies, we can hopefully generate more data and then publish in those avenues which are generated for sharing data. Like again, nature scientific data, please, check that journal is a great journal you can share your data there and then publish your data that's uh that, that that's basically my 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 two cents but about your question about the challenges as we all know that the one of the difficulties is uh, when you deal with the human data is always a big deal it's not like an image net that you can take photos of like amazing cats and dogs and rotate them and shift them around and say yeah this is the data it's like I mean, not that's a da bad data, it's a great data set, but I'm just saying that when you deal with human data, it's always a challenge. So there's this topic of federated learning, which I haven't seen much in medical robotics, when you can uh, decide not to share the data, but to share the intelligence. So that, I, I think, can be one direction in the future, that we can try to augment the model without sharing the data. And the computational algorithmic backbone is becoming kind of uh, more mature these days. So... I just want to also advertise that field of research, which can also help us to deal with some of these anonymization problems or challenges we have with uh, with, with data sets. Yeah. Yeah, data is, is a big challenge. In fact, in Europe, we have an initiative it's called uh, Surgical Data Science, uh, which is uh, not very well publicized and there are fewer people working on that, but it's, it's the beginning. And in fact, we contributed, you know, we, we put uh, some of the data sets on the open uh, domain and so forth. But I think the real challenge is the real clinical data. Because, uh, first of all, there are all the issues of anonymity and so forth, but also because they are proprietary of the companies. Now, Intuity doesn't release the data. I don't know about the other companies, but I'm sure they will follow the same pattern. Uh, we have another issue with the company that makes echographer. Uh, you know, echographer, you take a picture, you have the data, and the camera says, no, actually, they're all mine. So th this is an open problem that we really is not addressed. And uh, until we, we have access to, to real clinical data, real data of, inter of surgical procedures, we really don't know how difficult these data are, how complex it is to, to process them. Uh, only, as far as I know, there are only two institutions in the world that have worked out an agreement with Intuity. One is John Hopkins and the other one is the uh, University of Rennes. Uh, perhaps there's some other, but I'm not aware of them. And they're not, and they have agreements where they cannot share those data. So really, there should be some some pressure on the companies to to let at least subsets of this data available, so that people can train their algorithm, can learn how to to deal. You've seen that that picture of very complex, hidden uh, uh, Markov model to try to segment the data. And we are doing with data that have either collected in our laboratory with simple experiments, but real data will be a nightmare, but we need to start working with them. 
Yeah, in addition to what Paolo mentions, um, in Europe there is also more and more um, issue with GDPR and the ethical committees getting stronger and stronger. And so I think it's also something we need to address. They, uh, in Belgium, the, a lot of money goes to healthcare and all the experiments that are being done actually are owned by the hospital and they are getting more and more aggressive in uh, not uh, sharing data. So I think that's um, from a policy viewpoint, something that we also need to address. If we can demonstrate that the data is properly anonymized and cannot be retrieved uh, unless for GDPR uh, uh, reasons, if you they have the right to get uh, participants have the right to have their data removed. But if we can find a system that uh, is sufficiently robust, I think we should be able to, uh, or we should strive to force the government to uh, make these data sets available. Many companies, uh, maybe Intuitive is an exception, but like we work with uh, Philips and, and Barco, and also they actually don't have that much data because um, the ethic boards of the where they are, where their systems are installed, they say all the data that is generated is ours. So, uh, and they do, I don't know what they do with the data. Um, I don't think much. So uh, I think that's also a direction we could uh, look at for uh, hopefully solving the problem because a lot of data is uh, important. Yeah, I would like to uh, come back to our experience uh, with uh, uh, eye surgery. We uh, train um, uh, the system uh, to do autonomous uh, tool motion inside of the eye first with uh, some plastic uh, eye model. And uh, when the student, I asked them, okay, now could we do in, in uh, uh, cadaveric pig eyes? No, we need to start over everything. And uh, the student spent another six months just to train. And there are good results now. The question is, could we extrapolate these results from human eye? And the answer is no. Whatever it was done for pigs, it's working for pigs. If we like human eyes, we need to do in human eyes. We cannot do on cadavers because it's not a good model. You need to do in real, uh, uh, real eye. How we do this, we don't know. Well, we have an idea, but it is that doesn't fly, uh, you know, in reality. So, in order to develop good systems using uh, machine learning for clinical applications, we need data from uh, clinical trials, and that we are not there to to do that. But in the future, maybe we, we will be. That's very interesting. Thanks for sharing that perspective. So it sounds like there has been a lot of talk recently about, you know, um, transfer learning. So being able to, you know, learn on a specific task and then trying to generalize so that, you know, the agent uh, or the robot is, it becomes able to essentially perform the same task on, on like in scenarios which are similar, but not exactly the same. So that seems to be also a, a, a challenge we're all, we're all facing there. Um, it was also very interesting to hear about uh, different perspectives depending on, you know, where we are located geographically, uh, because certainly Europe right now seems to have the strongest uh, protections for for uh, patient data and for in general surgical data, which is, whereas in other parts of the world uh, it may be more it may be easier to actually get get a hold of of data. I wanted to continue the conversation on that um, on that topic, uh, you know, about geographical diversity and connect back to funding. Uh, earlier, what I heard from Julian is that. Um, you know, if you're writing an NIH grant, uh, you know, talking about AI can really be a hard sell. Um, I have to say, as a junior investigator, I, I've written multiple NIH proposals, and the, you know, the advice I normally get from my my mentors, so people who advise me, you know, like, uh, and who have been very successful with NIH funding, it resonates a lot with what Julian has been saying, which is, hey. You know, the National Institutes of Health is generally very risk adverse. Uh, so if you bring, be very careful about talking, to talk about robots or even to talk about AI, because panelists are going to jump on you. Uh, if you look online, typically the, the rosters of panels 
meeting panels for the NIH are public. So you can see this is like advice for those of you who may be starting a, a career uh, in, in, in the US. So you can actually see what people are going to review your proposal. You, you are not allowed, of course, to, to connect with them. That's, you know, like that's a big problem if you do. Uh, but you can see who sits on the panel and, and you can try to, you know, like that's very helpful to try and anticipate, you know, what questions they may bring up or may raise about your proposal. So that seems to be the case in the US for the NIH. Uh, but then last summer I submitted my NSF career proposal. So I went to the National Science Foundation and it was on surgical robotics. And I got, you know, like exactly, I talked to one of the program directors and they were actually giving me exactly the opposite advice, which was, oh no, you need to have autonomy in this robot. The robot needs to be intelligent. Otherwise, you know, like it's, where, where is the fundamental advance here? Uh, I was wondering if you could please comment uh, about your experiences with different funding agencies, uh, both from, you know, the not like North America and also other parts of the world. I remember being a PhD student in Europe during the seventh framework program. And the key word back then was cognitive, uh, which we saw a lot today in, in Paolo's talk. And, and that like stuck everywhere, even on my uh, dissertation title. Okay, I will start uh, from this end. Uh, so first of all, we don't have to criticize our funding uh, agencies. They are our friends, but we need to learn about their behavior <laughs> and try to adapt. So uh, if you like to sell a product to uh, uh, NIH, be aware that probably there, there are reviewers from clinical background, very likely one or two. And if you have a one or two engineers, you, you are lucky. So in that case, we need uh, to, to convince the clinicians that, uh, you know, artificial intelligence is, uh, is a future. I would like to give you an example. 10 years ago, we tried to uh, get money for a new uh, iRobot. And the clinician told us, we are very good at membrane peeling. We don't need robots for that. Three years ago, when I sent again, they were just asking, we mentioned there are in Europe, there are, it's, it's a robot uh, doing this. And they are asking, is your robot better than that? Of course, there are different reviewers, but 10 years ago, we don't need And now, okay, how you are doing better? Give us money to, you know, fill the gap. At NIH, it's a different story because there are engineers, there are researchers, scientists, and they like to see science. So in that case, you could do that. But we try to put together NIH plus uh, NSF and it's not flying. Anyway, it's, it's a good exercise. We need to be aware what we put in our grants and who our reviewers may be, as, as um, uh, you, know, you, you mentioned here. And that may give us you know, a little bit uh, more success in getting money. Basically, it's random. Yeah, sorry, I'm summarizing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is a lot of uh, randomness in there. Uh, in Europe, the funding actually was, as uh, was Loris mentioned, was a lot on cognitive and autonomy the last 10 years, I, I would say. Uh, and it was very difficult to find money to uh, buy or design a motor or something. And so now there is a bit a shift because they found out that actually um, some, in the end, they want that something works. And so they're more focusing on having this demonstrated on real systems. And so the recent trend is to have a combination of AI and new uh, mechanical actuation, new sensing and, there, and so on. And I, I, um, in general, um, yeah, if your ap the application is still very important where you, that you can demonstrate that uh, there is a big market for that, and that is beyond um, what clinicians currently are able to do, then that uh, tends to uh, be okay. Well, in Europe, the fund funding is divided into layers. The basic research, in theory, should be uh, assigned or is assigned to national fundings, and applied research is assigned to European funding levels. Uh, countries like Italy, there is no money for basic research, so we sort of contraband uh, the, the basic research into applied research, and, but, but this is particularly... That's why I left Italy, sorry. Yeah, right. So, you know, in, in Germany, in France, they have a very strong, in UK, they have a very strong national program. So this is, the, you don't need to do this, this sort of tricks. But, you know, the, the uh, although the European level funding has been a great success in terms of science delivered, it, it, it goes against its own uh, 
purpose of, of funding applied research. I just learned like a few few day, few weeks ago. There's only one point something percent of all the money that the, the European spends in research actually goes to some product, becomes becomes a product or is has an impact, a direct impact in the economy. And unfortunately, in Brussels, they realized that, and so they changed the the way proposals are, are evaluated, and now and are uh, required to to be written. So there is a very large part in impact, uh, economic potential, and things like that, which you know basically we have no idea what it is. And and the the worst part is there the reviewers are people who are uh, not engineers. They are business person, they are entrepreneurs who have no idea what we are talking about. So when you propose something that is sound scientifically and your economic impact uh, section are, are not very good, uh, your, your proposal is, is uh, crashed immediately because uh, it doesn't have any economic potential, but you know we have no idea how to write it. So this is, is good because it forces alliances with the economics department, with the sociology, with the impact of the society and so forth. And so we are in this transition where, and as Mano said, we are trying to be more, uh, the, the proposals should deliver a product, but the product should also be a, an economic success. Sure, you know, it's, it's, you, you don't do it in a proposal. So it's, it's a very tricky situation in Europe right now. Okay, so I I just want to start by first thanking the organizers for these amazing questions and very well thought. Uh, it's it's interesting to think about it. Uh, so we need funding, of course, and uh, I think we all agree on that. Uh, without funding, no student, no student, no research, no research, no progress. So uh, how to how to how to push it? I mean, like even this panel, or if you go out talk with people, the opinion about this topic is quite diverse and. I think the solution is just talking about it and having such workshops and panels and discussing and see how we can kind of push the envelope, right? To to put it to push it to the next level. Of course, it's a, it's new, especially when it comes to the medical and AI. There's a lot of questions, right? So that you guys have brought it up and you got different feedback. So and that 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 can be reflected. So I had the I had the pleasure of like uh, living in three different countries in the last few years. Uh, so and doing being in academia in different countries like Canada, UK, and then US. So I can see that this this kind of uh, questions or confusion, whatever we call it, exists. I mean, everywhere with different degrees and dimensions. So, uh, but but how we can actually solve it? I mean, as a junior faculty, I don't have much. I'm just experimenting personally to see how we can go around these uh, questions. And I'm, I'm not even sure if there's answer for that, but. I think uh, a, a panelist, a panelist, uh, a panel in a in a in a funding agency is like people like us sitting together and talking. So let's talk about it. Let's like kind of brainstorming more, having this type of conversation and discussion because I think that would be very critical to uh, to to help our colleagues on the panel to hear us, uh, so that when we have the proposal submitted, they can hear the other opinion but maybe yeah. next time we invite people from nsf and nih great and idea we torture them rather than they torture us this is, this is the best way i got no federal funding i don't know how you get it i just get rejected all the time welcome to the board yes yeah. i i like to use on that note i like to use the term declined instead of reject <laughs> yes, i just feel it's gentler you yeah. know like Reject is really harsh. Yeah, yeah. So not not discussed. Yeah. So do you mind changing the gear and asking actually the audience if you have any questions regarding the topics? That would be great. We just want to, don't want to be like a unilateral. We want yeah. to be bilateral, right? So. By the way, is there anyone here who is a researcher uh, not from? We have representatives yes. here from Europe US, and North Europe America. And is there anyone here who is not from Europe or North America? any experience sharing yeah maybe we can right. learn something i yeah don't be shy i see somebody like raising their hand in the back yeah, australia. australia you want to please let me come forward and then and and so what what career stage are you at right now phd student okay any information you have from funding agencies over Sorry, we are putting you on the spotlight right now. Yeah, <laughs> you made the mistake. Yeah, can you please come forward and then we can hear? Yeah, you made the mistake. No way to. Yeah, no pressure. Just come forward. Empty chair. 
doesn't please matter. give it. Give, doesn't give, matter. He made a mistake. Sorry, what's your name? <laughs> Andrew. Say again. Andrew. Andrew, can you please give it up for Andrew because he was like brave enough <laughs> to stand. Yeah. Question: Any information? Do you know anything like your PI? How they get funding? Is it easy? I know it's not easy, but just some information. If uh, is difficult. I do know a supervisor I had who, um, rather than applying as a medical application. Uh, make it a, another application, for example, with a steerable concentric tube robot. He was putting in the application for bomb diffusal. So it was like a, a military application, but also using it in a medical context. So it's sort of like um, um, uh, get a mix of uh, it's sometimes a bit hard to sell the medical robotics idea and get funding from uh, different suppliers. And yeah. yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. I, I, it just made me realize that I also, so normally, you know, like people like us in the United States, we go to the National Science, either the National Science Foundation or the NIH. There is also a little bit, uh, there are also fun, other funding sources, especially from the military. I mean, like, it's not mystery that, you know, the, the United States spends a lot of money uh, in, in with the Department of Defense. And there is um, a bit obscure, you know, program in the U.S. called Congressionally Directed. CDMRP, yeah. Yeah, that one. And I tried to apply, and it's very interesting uh, because it's really like... Um, random i mean like more definitely like there, there, there seems to be more randomness than than other places. i call it connection based rather than random yeah yeah, yeah it's also <laughs> random connection based yeah 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 thank you so much Andrew, for sure. any other questions you have regarding ai ml general like it doesn't need to be related to funding even audience over zoom i guess please go ahead And thank you. First of all, this is really um, interesting to listen to. Uh, I was wondering, do you think there is enough funding in uh, simulation work? Because it strikes me as if we had really solid simulations of the human body, potentially we could use it to prove safety of, of AI um, and without having to use it, obviously, in human subjects. Do you mind saying you are in the U.S. or like in Europe or... I am uh, in the U.S. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I could give you some feedback uh, here. You know, generally, artificial intelligence is related to autonomy. And now we are talking about Ashura autonomy. So basically, at least in uh, U.S. at Hopkins, we have an institute for Ashura autonomy, and it's uh, government-funded, and the people are looking uh, with, uh, with APL, like a little bit military, but uh, people are looking very clear, okay, if we develop it, we, we have to make sure it's, it's working. So I think it's funding. Uh, I don't know if we are able to access so easily, um, but uh, I hope that in the future, there will be uh, you know, specific programs coming from uh, NSF or NIH, for example, in US, or even DOD in, in US, that will be focused on such a kind of data. Now, only simulation, what you mentioned, is simulation for what they are looking for the final product. Simulation, it's for what? But again, I think there are um, govern, uh, the governments, they are looking to support such a kind of uh, uh, research or whatever uh, it is. And uh, even for uh, military application, it's still a, a good direction. Uh, yeah, so I think there is uh, a, quite some funding for uh, biomedical engineering, and 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 um, they have a lot of mon big conferences just on simulating all the anatomy. Uh, it may be not so trivial for us to go there because as soon as you are saying, yeah, I don't want the full detail until the last cell, and, uh, and then they uh, 
kind of look down a bit on, and then we would be declined, I think, as well. Yeah, on the other hand, we did, uh, we hurt ourselves because in Europe, at least, there were, there have been a number of, of uh, projects dedicated to simulation, the virtual physical human, uh, the, the human brain and so forth. And they didn't deliver very much. But on the other hand, when you propose it, the reviewer said, but you know, it was already done because it was written in the proposal. So it's sort of a game strange, you know, that it, it's like it was mentioned earlier, sometimes you want to do something, but you, you hide it into some metaphysical or hyperbolic uh, objective that you know you'll never get there, but it may attract the attention of the reviewers. Oh, this is new. This is something worth it. So it's, it's a little bit of a game, word game, how do you phrase what you, you describe and what you really want to do. And so you know, like if, if, like Mano said, that we want to do some, some useful surgical robot. If you write a proposal with that as the objective, you'll never get funded. Because they say, well, there's the products. Uh, so why do you want to fund research? So you have to say that is, you know, for uh, who knows, application on Mars. Perhaps Elon Musk will fund it. But uh, you know, uh, so you know, it's, it's just a, like walking on ice. You have to be careful on that. So that's a great question, actually. So. I mean, if I go back many, many years ago, like when I was undergrad um, and there was no Tesla, no autonomous driving and whatever, there was this like Robocop like competition that still existed. And one part of that competition was a simulation, only simulation. So, and a lot of algorithms that came out of that competition actually later on was took, I mean, was used in the I mean, people who do autonomous driving, autonomous vehicles, so on and so forth. So I think there's definitely a lot of, um, importance over there. Uh, uh, my very small thought here would be if a research, when you apply for funding, if it's only on simulation, uh, if it is theory, I mean, theoretical, you can, I mean, that can be one of the aspects that can be highlighted that, hey, look, this is amazing new theory and we're going to evaluate that with this amazing simulation because there's a benefit in simulation and that is you can keep the environment constant and evaluate different algorithm without changing that you have in the changes that you have in real world practices. So again, how it's being formulated, for example, in reinforcement learning board, it's quite common now because you cannot have the robot hitting the wall like a million times so that like they learn a policy. Uh, so that's kind of being accepted. Again, the question is how that is being formulated, but I think there is definitely um, it's, it's a possibility, it's a great possibility and happening in many aspects. The question is how you formulate it. But some minor thing I want to add is if you can verify your simulation model, like even with minor experiments, yes. I mean, I think you can use it. Why not? Yeah, sorry, I just... I still don't got any funding. <laughs> so no idea how you get funding. But there is a lot of work to be done in simulation for sure. There's nothing there right now. It should get funded, hopefully. I think we're getting close to the end of this session. Can I ask one final question? This is actually something I really care about. Um, not, not necessarily technical, but so with the, with the explosion of AI in, in recent years, um, one connected topic that became part of the public discourse has been, you know, um, social justice equity. Uh, making sure that the algorithms we are developing uh, don't create more injustice uh, that, that already exists. Um, and I think we've been, we've, there have been like some examples that made up in like, you know, there have been stories in the media um, thinking, for instance, about, you know, like certain face rec facial recognition algorithms that don't work well on people of color, to make an example. Uh, is it something that, you know, like in your own work, uh, you've considered it or you plan to consider in, in the future? Is there, are there any thoughts you may want to share on that? So one thing that came up um, recently in my work is a lot of the trainees didn't want to be measured since a lot of my work is on skill assessment because their attending is right there while I'm measuring their skill. And so right now I'm like, well, I have so few trainees that I'm not really measuring. Are you worse than your attending? It's are you you and your attending is them. But I think in the future, when I build up my um, training set, I will need to consider that more and maybe, you know, collecting the trainee and attending separately. And anonymizing it so that's not available um, but certainly that's something that 
I would consider. So this is a great question. Again, thank you for bringing it up. Again, when we go to AI, it's very important to make sure that, that the AI is not biased. So the first step is to make sure the data set is not biased. And that's, I think, the really first step to solving that. In my research, uh, we collect a lot of data uh, from uh, different like human subjects. Uh, and uh, if you don't take into account then the, the AI generated could actually have different performance for, so that's very important that we should all like, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm trying to actually be uh, very mindful of that. But uh, my question, I mean, maybe I answered the question with a question is that what we can do beyond the biasing the data set, right? So is there any, uh, and I know many people are doing research on that and maybe uh, that aspect can be more explored, but, uh, what if we go, uh, how we can go beyond beyond debiasing the data set to make sure the model generated is having the same performance for uh, different people from different uh, groups uh, uh, okay, who can benefit from that AI and robotics. So I think this is a great question and I'm very happy that you bring it up. So it's a good point that we, as a community, as a society, we take into account in any type of data-driven research that we do. Uh, yeah, so thank you. And the other aspect that we need to, to address is also to make the society or people sensible and aware of these risks. Uh, and I'm spending an enormous amount of time talking to groups of, uh, you name it, patients, medics, uh, uh, nurses, uh, general public, philosophers, uh, lawyers, to try to, to get different point of view. For instance, I mentioned that uh, uh, minor thing, if you want a common sense, if you talk to different groups, everybody has a different meaning of common sense. And, and uh, but, but you know, the, the community has to be aware that there are risks, that there are dangers, and then they could be exploited by algorithms. You know, this, uh, uh, you're aware of the Cambridge Analytics uh, uh, games of during the elections or so the past election uh, in the US. Uh, so AI is, is very useful, but also very tricky because again, people don't understand very well how it works, uh, but we need to, to emphasize and, and somehow spend part of our time talking to people and, and get their feedback, their impression, Sometimes they think that is magic, you know. Uh, sometimes, uh, or not sometimes, but often humans tend to give more credit to a machine than to another human. So we need to de-emphasize that and and uh, make people aware and sensible to this problem. Not only make sure that the data are correct, but make sure that people know that there could be risks. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, what can I tell? Um, I think data generation is very important. It uh, is a lot of time that is spent in determining what kind of patterns need to be uh, uh, generated and produced. And, and indeed, the um, racial aspects um, that would mean that um, we actually really need to invest in making sure that our uh, patient group is very rich and um, it's not evident depending on where you are located. So we have done some uh, work on that for eye tracking. And then it took, uh, let's say for one patient group, it was relatively fast to get the data. And for the other, it takes you another year before you have all the participants. So there is, uh, I agree, there needs to be uh, enough attention to that. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So um, sometimes ago I was in, um group talking about possible application for artificial intelligence and what we are suggesting using uh, developing an um, intelligent hospital, uh, meaning that basically you put a patient on the, on the bed and you have some uh, uh, previous information, takes up um, uh, vital signs, and after that, the patient will go kind of a conveyor it will be evaluated by machines, maybe back up with uh, with clinicians, and you know, at the end, will have surgery, go directly to the to the room, and uh, basically, people are asking what may take to to do this. Now, why should we do that? I have we have very good reason, but to do to uh, have such a kind of uh, idea implemented, it's a lot of work 
that will require a lot of artificial intelligence for each step, even recognizing the face or whatever you like. And at the end, because we realize it's too much to propose now, we are suggesting that uh, automatic uh, uh, you know, cornea. And in that case, it's easier You put the patient on the table, recognize the face, identify where the robot should go, you identify the disease and you do the surgery. That I think is possible. And that could be done even with what we have now. An intelligent hospital, that it's a uh, you know very futuristic idea but it's not beyond of uh, or, you know what what uh, uh, we are capable now yeah i think this is like a that technically we can do it i say maybe we have the technology but i want to wrap up the session because you are again five minutes beyond the planned <laughs> time so what I learned is like really good like uh, keywords. Oh, Paulo, you have yeah, to you know, go I ahead. just wanted to point out yeah. another point that, you know, we really should be aware of the social and ethical impacts because, you know, the, the hospital, automatic hospital is similar like the automatic factory. You know, a, a, in a, one of the latest uh, robots, it's cost 20,000 euros or dollars now and is uh, very capable of probably <clears throat> replacing almost completely a, a worker which costs uh, 20, 20 or 40,000 uh, euros a year. But, and so, you know, from the economic point of view, you, you will, we are going to push sort of the replacement of the, of the human workers, but then who will pay the social cost? We need to, to start thinking not only in terms of pure cost and pure economic advantages, but the cost of the whole society. And you know, we are seeing, you know, climate and, and other things that uh, when only one interest is pushed in one direction, then eventually they are creating these balances that, that uh, harm everybody. And the same thing would be with this autonomy. You know, if we are pushing it too hard without looking at the global picture, then we may run really serious risk of displacing a very large number of workers. And then the society has to pay for it, either in terms of turmoil or in terms of uh, social benefits or whatever. So, you know, let's push it because it's, it's a good science and so forth, but let's be aware that there are risks involved and, and try to, to promote a more equitable and more ethical kind of use of this technology. Yeah, thanks so much, Paolo. This means that as an engineer, we always look into the technical aspect of it. Because of our research, we involve surgeons, hopefully. That's good. But this means that not only we need to involve NIH and NSF people, we need to also have lawyers and other people like economists or other aspects and look at holistic view on all the, let's say, side effects of bringing a new technology. And that helps us also do an inverse engineering and design of AI to make everyone happy. It's super hard, I know, but I think we can do it. With that, I think I wanna appreciate the panelists and thanks so much for staying. So we have like 30 minutes, less than 30 minutes of lunch, sorry for that. And then we start the next afternoon session. Thank you. Let's uh, thank our panelists, if you don't mind. <laughs>